Uh, September 29th, 2016, it's 12.10 p.m. Um, so uh, we have the minutes as the first item on the agenda and a motion to approve the minutes of the prior meeting, which was held August 30th, 2016, uh, put forward by uh, Supervisor McDivitt, seconded by Supervisor Sokol. Any discussion on the minutes? All right, voting in, uh, for approval of the minutes, uh, say aye. Aye. Any nays? Hearing no nays, it passes unanimously with all members present. Um, the next item on the agenda is to uh, consider uh, a support of the resolution similar in style to the Schuyler County Legislator entitled <sighs> Resolution Calling on Governor Andrew Cuomo and the State Legislature to work with New York's Congressional Delegation to amend and improve the Family First Prevention Services Act of 2016 to ensure essential fiscal resources are maintained to support families in need. So I believe in your packet you have a copy of the Schuyler County Legislature uh, resolution. It's Family First Prevention Services, and it's a declaration. It's 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 noting that this Family First Prevention Services Act of 2016. Uh, House of Representatives number 5456 is moving rapidly through Congress and according to the declaration uh, in the resolution no public hearings or little debate and um, it's the intention to help children at risk of neglect or abuse and the federal legislation also requires excessive extensive, excuse me, extensive new reporting and information system requirements and eliminates federal funding for currently authorized services, imposes restrictive administrative and implementation barriers and puts a place punitive maintenance of effort funding requirements among other shortcomings and oversight. So the New York's Office of Children and Family Services estimates that New York State and its counties could lose up to $250 million annually in the currently available federal funds for child welfare. And it goes on to say that the bill would provide no credits to states like New York that were proactive and early adopters in providing prevention services for children and families at risk. And whereas Governor Cuomo and Senators Charles Schumer and Kirsten Gillibrand um, has notified them in a letter of the harmful impact of this re legislation, especially on New York, and they have provided suggested amendments. So it, this goes on, but it's a resolution to support that, you know, we support the idea of family first prevention services, but if the uh, federal government's going to go ahead with this, it shouldn't impose uh, unfounded mandates on states and particularly the counties. So I think that's the summary of it. But let me open it up for discussion. All right, seeing no discussion. Of I have a question. All right. Thank you. I move I things along, Claudia. Thank you. Um, I don't know if our county attorney has any opinion, maybe DSS, our DSS attorney. Do we know if this is, is the kind of ramifications that it would have? I don't know. I don't. They, I don't know if it's on. If they've reviewed it or not over across the parking lot. Yeah. Since it seems like it's a good idea, maybe. You know, wait for opinions and then from DSS maybe chime in. Yeah. To do some diligence on. Yeah. So, are you suggesting, uh, Supervisor Bramer, that we get an opinion from the Department of Social Services? on this matter? Yes. That's a good suggestion, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think agreement. Do we need a motion for that, or is it something we can table until we next month? Do the argument there. All right, so is everyone in the committee 
Uh, we'll table this and get an opinion from the Department of Social Services on this matter for our next month's meeting. Okay. We don't need a motion for tabling and things like that, do we? All right. Motion to table, put forward by Supervisor Soho, seconded by uh, 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 Supervisor. Supervisor Gerard. And all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any nays? Passed unanimously. All right. We'll table that for next month. Next on the agenda. Aaron, yeah. Would you like to drop forward to my committee? You want it to go to committee, or do you want it to go to the department and then go? Bad idea to bring it to no, I don't. I think okay. that's a good idea. So. Do we still have the attorney to look at it though? Over there. All right. So three things: we'll have the Department of Social Services look at it, we'll have the uh, county attorney look at it, and we'll have uh, the uh, Social Services Committee look at it. And then hopefully if it makes a round. We'll bring it back here for further discussion after we have further information. Okay, next on the I, on the agenda are discussions. Uh, Bob Schultz, Mr. Schultz, in an oral way, because we're trying to get out of here in a reasonable time, can you give us an overview of what you would like us to support? So you have a floor. Um, can I go quicker? I have a yeah, can you throw I have a thumb drive with a PowerPoint presentation that I can breeze through that I think would address. Could you use the podium if you're going to stand back there? So I have a thumb drive with a PowerPoint presentation that I can breeze through that should address uh, and answer your questions, any possible questions. Um, you know you like to move things along? Uh, well, Mr. Mr. Schultz. So uh, it's your choice. Yes, if you could introduce the topic. Is there any time factor, any reason why we have to come up with a position at this moment, or is this something that down the road, when we learn more about it, we will have a position? Because I can give you another follow-up opportunity to discuss matters, but today I'd like to move I things understand. along. It's late. Uh, so good afternoon. Um, so there's a question coming on the ballot next year. The New York State Constitution requires that the question be on the ballot every 20 years. The question is this, quote, shall there be a convention to revise the Constitution? Of course, they're talking about the New York Constitution. Shall there be a, 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 um, a convention to revise the Constitution and amend the same? The last, um, the, the, the New York State Constitution, just a word about that first. Um, we're not mentioned, the people are not mentioned in the Constitution except that we adopt it. The New York State Constitution, no word finds its way in or out except by a vote of the people. And by those words, we the people structure the government, top to bottom, and we regulate them. We tell the government what they can do, what they cannot do, and what they must do. So the New York State Constitution is the people speaking. It has 20 articles. Article 19 is the amendment article. How does it get amended? I did um, ask the clerk's office to make copies of Article 19. It's not long. It has three sections. What Article 19 says, in effect, is that there are two pathways to amending the New York Constitution. The government has a pathway, and the people have a pathway. And if there's a conflict, the people's recommendations prevail. So you have um, Article 19 in front of you. The first article deals with the government's approach to amending the Constitution. Um, it has amended the Constitution 168 times since the last Constitutional Convention, 
where the people adopted the convention delegates' recommendations. So uh, section one of uh, Article 19 says basically if the government, the legislature, decides it would like to see a change to the Constitution, it must pass that recommendation twice. There must be an election between the legislatures, so it's two successive state legislatures must pass it, and then it goes to the voters. You may be familiar, of course, with one of the recent amendments passed as a consequence of the government wanting uh, to put that before the voters, and that was the amendment uh, to the Constitution authorizing commercial casino uh, gambling facilities. So that's section one. Section two is for the people's pathway. The people have a pathway to change regardless of whether the government um, wants a change or wants a convention or not. Every 20 years, we get the opportunity to take all of our power, the people's power, into their own hands and to evaluate the performance of their government and to make recommended changes. Regardless, no change to the Constitution can occur unless the proposed change gets put before all the voters in the state, whether it's the legislature proposing the change or whether it's the delegates to a constitutional convention recommending the change. So section two relates to the um, constitutional convention approach, the people's pathway to change. Section three simply says, look, if the legislature twice passes a proposed amendment and puts it before the voters on a particular subject, and the delegates to the convention have a proposal going to the people on, a, on a, the same subject, the people's um, proposal prevails. So if there's a conflict between what the government is suggesting as a change to the amendment and what the people's delegates, the delegates to a convention recommend, it's the delegates to the convention who prevail. So the Constitution says that if the people vote yes in, say, 2017, then the following year, now we're in November 2018, the people will elect the delegates to the co Constitutional Convention. It says there will be three from each state senatorial district elected and 15 at large. That's 204 delegates will be elected in November of t um, 2018. The Constitution, go uh, Constitution goes on to say that the elected delegates will then take their seats and begin their work in April of the following year. So now we're in April 2019. It says they will take as long as necessary to do their work. They will spend whatever is necessary to do their work. They can be paid if they want to accept that salary at the rate that an assemblyman, state assemblyman, is paid. And they get to choose how they will propose, how they will put their recommendations before the voters. In 1967, we had a convention. There were some 38 recommended revisions to the state constitution. The delegates to that convention put them all in one package and put it to the voters. The voters said, no, thank you. They turned it down. The uh, issue, of course, is, in my view, um, and this is the basis of my recommendation here. There is the people and there is the government. If the government, if employees of the government, employees of political parties, employees of the registered lobbying organizations, 
become delegates to the convention, those people who the document regulates, this is who we regulate. We regulate the government. We regulate lobbyists. We regulate political parties. If those people become delegates to the convention, then in effect, the government is controlling both pathways to constitutional reform or governmental reform. The intent behind the Article 19 is that the people have to have their way, a pathway of taking all of their, after all they have the ultimate power, the people have the ultimate power. They have to have the ability to take that power into their own hands at least once every 20 years to evaluate the performance of their government and to recommend to everyone reforms or changes to, the, um, to how we regulate or how we hold government accountable. There's, God knows in this state, there's huge opportunity for reform. Uh, we have a government that unfortunately is um, not always serving the people. There's lots of opportunity so for change. So the issue becomes uh, what can be done? We, we need to call attention to the fact that those in government do not belong as and lobbyists and those in political I'm talking just the employees of political party they do not belong there as delegates that was the intent of the delegates to the convention who added this provision to the constitution but over time that has been changing initially uh, you had uh, shopkeepers and homeowners and so forth being delegates to the conventions, but over time that's changed. It got so bad, it has become so bad, that in 1967, the Speaker of the Assembly was the President of the People's Convention. The Vice President was the head of the Senate. You had 28 judges. David Dinkins, as a young Assemblyman, was a delegate. Of the 186 delegates, over 120 were attorneys. And what do, do you expect? What do the people expect those delegates would recommend? They would recommend changes that serve government. And we have in our state constitution a provision. It's been there from the beginning. It says the neither the state nor its municipalities can borrow money without the voters' approval. Now, I know we do it all the time. One of the recommendations of the delegates to the 67 convention, stacked with people coming from government, was to eliminate, to repeal that provision. They also had provisions, uh, recommendations, to make it easier for local governments to tax. This is intolerable. 1938 was the last time we had a convention where the people adopted the recommendations of those delegates. 1938 is closer to the Civil War than it is to today. That's how long it's been. And so I see the need in 1997 when I began to wake up to these issues, I brought a lawsuit recognizing this issue and recognizing what happened in 1967. I sued my state senator, state assemblyman, local government officials, asking the court to declare that it would be a conflict of interest for them to be delegates at the next state constitutional convention. And Judge Hughes said, well, Mr. Schultz, you have to name everybody that you think 
by name, everybody that you think would be, would have a conflict of interest if they were a delegate. Now I said, Judge, I can't do that. That's everybody and every authority. Through a authority, MTA, that's uh, everybody and every public corporation, every county, every town, these are all public corporations. I can't do that. He said, sorry, you have to do that. This time, and I thought five years would be su sufficient time to get this issue resolved. So in 2012, I brought a lawsuit. And I had six classes. I'm told by attorneys that it's the first class action lawsuit against the government. But I had six classes of defendants. I named Andrew Cuomo, not as governor, but as an employee of the executive branch and state executive branch and all others similarly situated. I took them all in. Dean Skelos. I didn't want to show any partisanship. Dean Skelos as an employee of the state legislature and all others similarly situated. Michael Bloomberg was mayor at the time. Michael Bloomberg, not as mayor, but as an employee of a public corporation. That takes him, and all others similarly situated. Danny Donahue, president of CSEA. Danny Donahue, as, and so forth. You, you get the idea. There were six classes of defendants. And I asked the court to declare that it would be a conflict of interest for any of them to be at a delegate, to be a delegate at, at the, a convention, at the next uh, constitutional convention. And unfortunately, the, <laughs> the judiciary was also named as a, as a defendant. Uh, Bob? Yes. <coughs> All right. To summarize. So, so I'm asking yeah. this, uh, the Warren County Board of Supervisors, to get the ball rolling, to pass a resolution and you have the resolution in front of you, uh, pass a resolution that would agree that it is a conflict of interest for employees of the government, employees of registered lobbying organizations, and employees of political parties, those who are regulated, to be delegates at the next state constitutional convention, the purpose of which is to make recommendations to the document that's designed to govern their behavior. That's simple. Okay, so, so what we have here is the proposal that the people will vote on next year in the 2017 election as to whether we want to have a constitutional convention or not. And the public could vote no, they could vote yes. Now, if they vote yes, then the following year we will choose delegates. There will be three from each Senate district for six, 63 Senate districts and 15 at large. So for a total of 207 delegates, will be elected by the people, right? 204. Okay, that's what I said, 204. Okay. So but here's the we, issue. We, we do elect the individuals. What you're saying, I believe, is that those individuals that we choose to elect or not should not be office holders in okay. summary. So, if that's the summary and you're shaking your head in acknowledgement, then that would require a change in the Constitution. So that could be part of the Constitutional Convention package in itself when, we, when they meet to decide the changes in 2019, or it could be done in the Section 1 of Article 19 method. It could be introduced in the legislature this year, then an election, and then it, and it has to get voted on again after the election cycle, and then that could produce a change. Either way, you're not going to get that done before uh, the 2017 convention. Mr. Mr. Chairman, you missing an important point. Yes. We the people have a right to know before November of 2017 whether a yes vote may result in a convention run by the government. We need to know be, be, between now and then that those in, we're not going to have a repeat. But isn't that impossible under no. the current constraints? No. You can pass a resolution that agrees with this concept that says those in government have their own way, their own pathway 
pursue constitutional change. This is the people's pathway. We in government have no business being delegates. And it would be wrong for anyone in government uh, to run for delegates. We need to know, we have a right to know, I think. Well, we have a right to know before November of next year that those, we have a responsibility to field a slate of yeah, but you candidates can't. of the best and brightest from each of the 63 senatorial districts, yes. But given the constraints, you can't meet that criteria before the 2017 election cycle. No, no. Um, and not, unless and the other unless thing, there's... The other thing is... Mr. Chairman, unless the government, beginning with this board, will be asking other counties to do the same thing. Unless the government takes a proactive stance on this issue, this fundamental conflict of interest issue, then the people are going to do what they did in 77 and they're going to do what they did in 97 because the League of Women Voters and all of the good government organizations around the state urged them all to vote no until the state legislature passes a law that says uh, they can't run. Okay? And, and that didn't happen. Uh, and, and so the people voted no because this delegate eligibility issue was not settled and we can't afford to go another 20 years, you know, you're without You're going to have to because at this point in time you No, can't. Mr. St wait, wait a minute. There's, I, I, what's preventing the Board of Supervisors from passing a resolution that agrees with this concept? That nothing, those in government... Nothing, but in practical reality, it okay. won't happen unless the voters approve the Constitutional Convention in 2017. No. Then they elect the delegates, and then you want your delegates to address this issue. No, Mr. Chairman, unless the, those in government make an issue out of this, as I'm asking them but to do... But they can't change it, Bob. No, you can... What's to prevent this board from passing a resolution There's nothing that agrees. preventing this board. I am just pointing out that physically we cannot make the change. The Constitutional Convention delegates can make the change if we go in that direction, no. or the legislature can make the change by introducing it to two legislative cycles, which ain't going to happen before The Constitutional Convention has already made that change. All right, all right. This is the intent behind Supervisor the Bramer. Thank you. Yes. Thanks so much for waiting all morning. I know it's been a long day. I appreciate your presentation because when it came up to us before, I wasn't sure what the language of the resolution was specifically looking for. So now I, I have a much better understanding of your concern. And I, I agree with you that with, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do to change what the Constitution says, which these delegates get elected by the electorate. And there's no qualifications in the Constitution as to who can run to be a delegate. I don't know that process. I'd like to research that more for myself, but until we even know there's a constitutional convention going to happen in after November of 2017, I'm not That's sure it makes much sense to It makes sense to me, it. Supervisor Bramer, to go along with what you're saying, is that Bob introduced the topic to us. Yeah. Now I think it's got to settle. Bob, would you be uh, available to come back and we can rediscuss this after letting it digest a month, next month? Sure. Happy to come back. I would like to give the PowerPoint presentation. And I'll accommodate you next month, and uh, hopefully we'll, they'll schedule us. Maybe on a standalone. Yeah, not I on a day where we have to wait three hours I, to get so up there. I'm so surprised that in, uh, in your budget deliberations that you made room for this, and I apologize. Uh, and I, uh, uh, All right, so that seems like a, a great suggestion, but uh, On this issue, I'll, I'll go one better. Um, I'll schedule a lecture, PowerPoint presentation uh, at, I don't know, ACC or someplace, and uh, give you plenty of time and encourage uh, all those employees of the government, lobbying organizations and the political parties to attend and get their questions and get into this. This is a very serious matter. To deprive... And, uh, and uh, Mr. Schultz, do nothing is I am right. sympathetic to your thought here, okay? Uh, but but um, we'll continue this conversation. But Supervisor McDivitt... Thank you. First of all, Mr. Schultz, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. I think you're 
providing a service. Uh, just one quick question as, as it relates specifically to, uh, uh, I'm a part-time legislature, uh, I'm a member of the Board of Supervisors, uh, uh, will this eliminate me from potentially being a delegate? Is the Board of Supervisors regulated by the Constitution? Yes. Yes. And so it's wrong to be a delegate at a convention. The purpose of it, you have your own approach to amending the Constitution. It's wrong to be a delegate at a convention, the purpose of which is to come up with a document designed to govern your behavior. It's so fundamentally wrong. And to put it off and do nothing until we see if the people vote yes is, is a vote for a no vote. Right. The people will vote no again because they yeah. have no, uh, unless you've studied it, you have no idea of the corruption and the waste from the 67, you know, convention. All right. Uh, and, that, and it'll happen all over again. And the, the intent of... I did... Uh, um, the intent of Article uh, 19... If you look at who said what, when they put that provision in our state constitution, it was to give, to separate, give both the government and the people a pathway to change. Okay. okay uh, but we don't study the constitution. We all don't. Right. Uh, Bob? Ra each raising, uh, rising Give us a chance to digest some of this. I just, yeah. I just handed, I did do some research before the meeting, <laughs> and the League of Women Voters put out a nice, easy, yeah. quick package of what you're trying to say, because the, you are not the only reformer who is asking this question and a, and asking us to take a look at it. You're not alone. But, uh, Supervisor Leggett? Well, I was just saying that um, I'm always interested in this topic, and it is well presented. Thank you very much for it. And my first concern comes up that you are going to be prejudicing against a whole class or six classes of, of people that may not be guilty and we need to be careful about that you are presuming guilt but before and and not to extend the conversation but that's that's just my feeling I think we should bring this to a close that so that we can can go on and I look forward to hearing more all right so and Bob if there's other information that you wish to share get that to me or, or Amanda and she will share that with the committee before next month's meeting I believe I have already submitted to Amanda uh, the pages from the PowerPoint that has a lot of information in All it, right. uh, but I'll present it hopefully uh, at the next meeting and I will try to schedule something for the community at large and would hope All right. that those of you, uh, it, we're not prejudicing. People in government made that choice to All be right. in government. All right. It's and government I versus the people. Yes, Bob. Yeah. I, th I think yeah, it's uh, you made your point, yeah. okay. okay? And I want to thank you for your presentation. I think it's very thoughtful. Um, are there any further questions on behalf of the uh, committee? Seeing none, is there a motion to table this till next month for the purpose of obtaining additional information on the topic? So Put forward by uh, Supervisor Leggett, seconded by Supervisor Bramer. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. It was unanimously passed. Call me if you have any questions. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The voting process, the voting of the delegates, that's something I'd be interested in knowing more about. Um, right. So not just this, yeah. Right. The actual logistics. If the people vote yes, in my view, we'll vote. I don't know. There's the a big push this year to do it. Yeah, but the teachers' union, the CFEA, um, Boy, they, they're out there. They've been out there for a long time telling all of their members to vote no. Okay? Uh, because they're afraid, yes, you know, the pension provision or something is going to get tampered with. It's okay. All right. Thank you. No, thank you. All right. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Uh, next item is smoking. Now, Chairman Garrett, yes. is there something you wanted to... Yes. Uh, you know, we got the, got the petition signed by 78 people. Also, I got um, an email uh, sent from, um, geez, Amy, Amy Clute, and, you know, she's concerned about the employees walking out to the, the edge of Glen Lake Road and and uh, walking different areas, and I guess they've had an incident where somebody came out of the bushes uh, or startled them over there by Glen Lake, so that she isn't taking a stance on whether we should put in a 
smoking area for these people, but she's just brought it to my attention. Obviously, you know, there are, the smokers are, are hoping that we would set aside areas on the campus for them, and that's not what our uh, that's not what our regulations say. I bring this to your attention. It does come up. Um, you know, about once a month or once every couple of weeks, you know, with a smoker. I, I don't know how you feel about it. I mean, I just, if there's a compromise that we could work on, maybe we should try to do it. But if you don't feel that we should try to compromise and we cold turkey and just, because Dan, Dan Durkee through public health is offering, you know, patches and, and sending out information on how to uh, quit smoking. But I, wouldn't do my job if I didn't continue to mention this to One you. One of the so. proposed compromises was to designate a it couple of evil. smoking areas, but for a certain amount of time, so it's very clear that there is going to be a date, a sunshine date, where those smoking areas are going to be non-smoking areas as well. So that was one compromise put forward, but let's listen to what the committee members have to say. Yes, Supervisor Gerard. I don't, I've never smoked, I don't like smoking, etc. but I just think in practicality we're, we're creating a safety issue and I see that in other industries with them invoking it where people have to walk extensive amounts of territory to get to an established place that it's legal for them or, or it's not going to jeopardize their job and generally it's on a roadside or whatever and that's what's happening here. We, we have unfavorable conditions in the winter. Um, ice, rain, et cetera. I, I, I mean, we hired Needham Industries uh, almost 10 years ago to look at all kinds of safety aspects, which we were lacking in in the county. They've made great strides in addressing small towns, cities, our county employees, et cetera. And I think by invoking this, we're, we create a double standard where, um, you know, we're frowning on and trying to stop the smoking and all the hazards that that for presents but we're creating a safety issue and when something happens we're self-insured as far as compensation if someone slips and falls and does a knee and is out of work we pay for that so I think I think we need to compromise and look at it um, to give them an area to go do what they do uh, that's my opinion with uh, sunshine day I, I could tolerate that I mean I, I think I'm in a minority um, and I would I would accept any any Compromise. What a sunset date! Uh, you know, I I think it's good that we do this. I I guess in trying to get people to stop smoking. I understand all that, but I think just to do bring the guillotine down and have it stop, it's created a lot of difficulty, and we, you know, we might. All right. And I had this one man who came in to me, tears welling in his eyes. His son just died from lung cancer, and we all know who it might be. I'll tell you the name after recording shut down and he said please tell them no smoking because his son was a heavy smoker and he's attributing that lung disease that killed him to smoking uh, and we all know this, this is no surprise all right so and, and I, I, you're I, saying I, I with that. if I'm reading you you're saying that we currently have a no smoking policy you would you would favor amending it to give certain designated areas to smoking. You would also favor some kind of sunshine clause that, hey, everyone, uh, it's clear it's going to be a no smoking campus whatever months from now. I think that's a fair way. Okay, Supervisor Leggett. I would not be in favor of a sunset clause or sunrise, which I have a way. Does that mean you would favor I can smoking see, I can areas? See it being, being brought up of I am in favor of smoking areas, okay. yes. Yes, but without any time restriction on them. They can always be brought b before the board again at, at another uh, point in time. All right, so we have smoking areas with uh, Supervisor Jard saying yes and agreeing to a sunshine clause. We have Leggett saying yes and no sunshine clause. And just so, and, uh, Supervisor Brown? I, I am not in favor of the areas. I think that once we put them in, people are going to use them and they're, they'll, a sunset provision won't really be enforceable. 
I think that I'm not telling anyone to stop smoking. I'm telling them that when they come on to county grounds, they have to stop while they're working here. It would just be the same as if we were in a factory producing. I, I used to work in a food processing plant. When you walked in the plant in the morning, you, you, you can't smoke in that plant, and you don't get to smoke again until you leave at the end of your shift eight hours later. Okay. So, Council Supervisor McDivitt? Yeah, I'm, I'm torn a little bit. I, I, I know the hospital uh, who has a no-smoking campus, they, they did it in stages, uh, as, as I think you're suggesting, John. Uh, uh, and so maybe that was a... Uh, a provision to uh, end it at some point. Uh, there's, there's no possible way I, I can support this if there's not uh, an end line day. Uh, so I, I, I would vote no on it. But I. Um, but that's yes with the sunset. Oh, absolutely. Have to be. Have to be. Now, in terms of what are the suggested smoking areas, then that must be. Well, and that's what I was going to bring up next, and I don't want to rain on your parade, but having worked in a manufacturing facility that had this, and it, it is a royal pain for, you know, that put smoking areas in. Now, my question would be, do you designate one for this building and one for that building, and then who, who maintains them? Who cleans them? And, you know, who takes care of them? And where are you going to place them? I mean, and... I know there's an existing gazebo out there that I, I'm not sure if that's an area where they congregate or used to congregate, but, you know, I, I am too. My son, 45, had cancer uh, uh, a year and a half ago, and he was a smoker. So, you know, I know what, I know what, know what it does to you personally, and I never smoked in my life, but, you know, I do kind of feel, and I don't like, going out this driveway and seeing those people standing on the side of the road. And, you know, I can see the issues in the wintertime, Dan. I can, I can see it. I'm just afraid if we put something in and say, okay, six months from now, we're going to end it, then six months from now, we'll be having this discussion. They'll want to go another six months and another six months. I mean, are there avenues for the smokers? Can they go have a cigarette in their car now without us? I mean, without the smoking police? doing that? I mean, I, I just don't know, rather than walking out the side of the road, can't they go sit in their vehicle and have a cigarette if they want to? I mean, I, I don't know. What's our policy? I can't remember what the policy said about. There's just, cars on campus. Right. Yeah. So that's not a viable option. So, and it's that's kind awesome. of, so, well, they kind of look the other way, but I think, I think we're just trying to send a message, at least three of us are trying to send a message that you got to quit smoking. I mean, I, you know, if you, you don't, put, if you don't put a sunset you, you, on this, what's going to keep You can going? give them a reprieve, but I'm just saying, if you, even if you give them six months, if you think it's too quick, where we just, you know, because really it should be no secret. Most of the towns have done this. I mean, we did it. I mean, Morrisburg did it a year ago. We did no smoking on public grounds and stuff, and we didn't. We certainly don't get to push back. Of course, we don't have 700 employees either. And most people had quit smoking. You know, we had some heavy smokers up there, but they had already quit. If you put it six months, at the end of six months, if you, if you guys, I, I'm okay with either way, you know, because I, you know, I had a management at International Paper, too, and it's a pain, but whatever you want to do, I'll go. Well, there is five of us. Uh, there are five of us, I should say, and that is a quorum. I don't know. I don't know if it'll be. You know, if it goes to full board, even with the sunset and the place, I don't either. I don't think it will. So it seems like three out of five uh, would agree to keeping the ban, but allowing a s you know a, s a, s a couple of designated places for smokers with the sunset of some period of time. We haven't determined that, but uh, Supervisor Leggett. Uh, and obviously, the sheriff's facility is on the campus, so they're included in this ban, correct? Yes. No. No? They're not? Uh, when, and if I, if I made a mistake, I apologize, but when we drafted that, it was the, um, this part of the campus and um, these two addresses 
there because Warrensburg gets treated differently in the policy that already exist as it already existed. The sheriff's department was treated differently, and Warrensburg was treated differently, and other officers were treated differently. And the sheriff called me and asked about that, and he said he wanted to be excluded. And I said, I think you already are in the policy, so I didn't change that when I drafted it. Uh, the inmates are not allowed to smoke, are they? I don't believe There's so. There's no tobacco. Um, the inmates are, are not allowed okay to smoke. Are you okay with them walking over there? Walking all the way over there. Well, they're walking they're all the way over to the road and getting so hit, potentially. I, I, so I guess I don't understand that exemption. Oh, yeah, that's that. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. What, 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 what it should what be the whole uh, campus. What are they? I mean, you can't even have tobacco over there. I mean, it's that's that's contraband. Well, not for this. I, in the in the facility. The but sheriff's officers though can probably come outside and all right, stand all in the right. parking lot. All right, all right. Supervisor, the floor. And, and then just so that all county employees are treated fairly, then we should ban if it's if there's going to be a ban here uh, on the property. Then it should be on every county property, and um, you know, take it, take it from there. Anybody that gets a Warren County paycheck, including me, I, you know, I'll, I, I won't smoke it wherever I am. Are you a smoker? What? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was like, what? You're not a smoker. Frank left. I gave him every opportunity to come back. I said, Frank, come back. Well, okay, then we, yeah, we ban on all properties. We'll give it a six month. <laughs> Phase-in period, sunset at the end of six months. But I'm not in favor of giving a pavilion because that really is going to be hard well, to take away. that's your idea. Is that that's my idea. And you're going to stick with that. They don't have a pavilion now. They're walking. Right All right. Now. So well, they wanted a pavilion. They were supposed to come back with at cost so estimates. And stuff. Supervisor Bramer's proposition is that we should ban it on all municipal properties. And oh, the sheriff is coming. Will allow given smoking areas for a six month time period with the understanding that after six months it's going to be no smoking through all municipally owned properties. Yeah. Now, six months just came out of nowhere. You know, if it was seven years, I would, I would be in favor of that. What? <laughs> it takes time. It takes time. All right. How about one year? How about five? Uh, wow. Just, no. Not in this day and age. No. I, even one year, I'm pushing my. I, I think I think six is a little too short, just from the perspective. All right, if, so if you one buy, year. If you, yeah, if you buy the argument of, of safety and ice, where one year six months not enough. Make it till June. Year next year. I, I'm just looking at the practicality of getting to the full board and having something have a chance of passing. So I, I think if <clears> year is. Well, we'll turn it over we facilities. We need to find two areas like. That needs to be part of it. Those are right. the two. We'll turn it over to facilities. Facilities yeah. committee to, to yeah. find out what kind of error. <laughs> All right. If so if we get back to, to this, a lot of it is about um, direct smoke and indirect, indirect right. and second hand. So it becomes a functionality. So to say that on this campus, these property boundaries were set way back when, but for this issue that if um, if we were on a one acre lot instead, it would be one thing, but we're on a five acre lot, and it's another thing. So it's the function of this ban. It's so that other people are not um, affected by smoking, and it is also about safety, so that uh, people that do smoke are not um, doing it beside the road in our, our image. So it really becomes more spatial. And if you put designated smoking areas a certain distance from populated or used spaces and that are in safe areas, um, yeah, no smoking around the gas pumps, yeah, that will um, then I, I, it, it accommodates. All right, so what I'm getting. The recommendation we would to the facilities committee is that the no smoking policy should apply to all county owned properties that we would support for a one year time period only appropriately placed designated smoking area. For employees. For employees. I, th I think the public, once they come on, it should be smoke free for them. All right. So I'm just trying to think, since we have not identified where someone can smoke, uh, 
We're going to send it to him. Well, that's why I tried to word this appropriately. Yeah. Okay. Like I can go over there and figure out where okay. they would be satisfied walking to. We'll let the back parking lot and, yeah. and then here and then. Okay. I guess that would. I just don't think that can be. We'll let the chairman the determine the appropriately placed. No, that okay. gazebo should yes. be smoke free. Yes, it should. All right, so. Yeah, I heard you. I heard you. I'm not ignoring you. Okay, so. Uh, We're on tape. Buddy, right. do you make that motion? Yes. All that you just said. Yes. Is there anybody to second that motion? Second. Seconded by uh, Supervisor McDivitt. All those in favor of this recommendation to the facilities committee. And motion to the facility. Uh, the motion is that no smoking policy should apply to all county owned properties. And the second part of that provision would be the committee is willing to except appropriately placed designated smoking areas for employees for a one year time period only. One for each building. One for the main building. I think they can pick it up. I don't, don't think they had a facility, so I mean okay. we'll work to make it out of the facility. Well, Amanda wondered if you want to just see the, before we vote on this to go to facilities. Do you want to see where the facilities would be? Yeah, yeah, that that would be good because no. it has. To, yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll, we'll just table it until next month. No, we'll just take it to but facilities committee. Right, we'll talk have about them it. in yeah. preparation for facilities we'll committee. We'll talk to facilities. Find we'll some Frank, uh, them being Jeff or whoever. Frank, Frank, Frank. Frank. Put out. That's what we asked a month ago. Is show get us some ideas of where these spots would be. I suggest the boys' room. Oh, wow. back to those days. Oh, I thought you were a greenie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So both. Amanda wanted to know if we're suggesting both provisions, and I think the understanding is yes, and the uh, resolution was put forward by Supervisor Framer, seconded by Supervisor Leggett, right, or McDivitt. So all those in favor of those two aspects of the recommendation going to the Facilities Committee say aye. 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 Any nays? Aye. One nay. So, and, and I'm an aye. So that's four to one. It passes, but not unanimously. Okay. Smoke. Smoke. Uh, <laughs> Real quick, rules and voting procedures for declaration of executive sessions. All right. Executive sessions can be called and uh, once a regular meeting has started and you need the majority of the total committee members to be to vote in favor of going into executive session that's the committee members that are present no no total of the committee so if your committee is nine people you need five votes oh. you may only have six people present you need five votes to go into executive session. Um, the other thing is, when you go into executive session, you should use Article 7, Section 105. A lot of people just try and say, well, it's personnel. That's not acceptable. I mean, you have to be looking at the medical, financial, credit, and I use F all the time employment history of a particular person or corporation. So if you're looking at the financial credit, employment, or history of a corporation, such as you might when you want to discuss, you know, RFPs, you're talking about particular corporations, I think that's valid. If I say anything wrong, straighten me out. Okay, I will. Um, you know, the preparation grading e exams, and it goes on, the acquisition, sale, or lease of real property. Now, attendance at the executive session shall be permitted to any member if the body that's present, I think you only need a majority of them, that approves a person who is outside of the committee to be part of the executive session, that can happen. 
but it has to be a majority of the present committee approving the outside person not of that committee to be part of that executive session. So the, the things to be concerned about is though, you and I are kind of obligated to keeping everything in executive session private. The individuals that you allow into executive session, I, you have to keep in mind, uh, will not be, may not necessarily be bound by that privacy issue. So, you know, so, but you are allowed to have people outside the committee as part of the executive session. Now, because of what happened with a certain individual here who thought that they should be part of the executive session and were not, um, they wanted us to review the rules. And I think it's appropriate that those rules that I just kind of outlined, and maybe Brian has more for us to consider, should be shared with all chairpersons in, in the county, that here is what executive session is all about, just so we don't make future mistakes. And I think that's all this particular individual is asking us to do, because that particular event has gone by. But in the future and moving forward, we should all make sure that here are the rules and we abide by the rules. Brian? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am working on a draft and I've got it fairly well complete, except I want to uh, just ensure that everything I have on here is exactly what the, the board is looking for. But I have a, a draft um, summary of some of the procedures that we use regularly. I've addressed quorum, uh, methods for voting, uh, voting procedures and executive session. So as long as I'm, as, as soon as I'm confident that everything that you want to know is in there, then I will distribute that. Uh, it's sort of like a, a cheat sheet that refers to the uh, public officer's law, uh, Robert's Rules of Order, and it, it gives what I believe to be a, a checklist of what you need to do in particular situations. All right, and that sounds good. So is that something we need to review before we approve it to send out to other chairpersons or? What I'd propose is that as soon as I, I would say in the next few days, um, I'll have it exactly where I want it and, and complete and, and uh, final. And then I'd like to uh, distribute it um, to all the, um, all the members of the Board of Supervisors sure. and yeah. you know, have it. Do we need a motion for that or anything? I don't think so. I wouldn't think so. We just, I think everyone here is in support of that. Okay, thank you. So I, I guess I didn't realize that, that if the committee's 11 and you only have six here, that the people present don't don't well, constitute the quorum. And that's right. But here's another thing, Brian, I'd like to add to that. Because we usually do ayes and nays, that if there are no nays, I think it's fair to assume okay. they are all ayes who are present. Here's, here's the because that was one of the issues that this individual brought up. My research on that, I, I, as soon as that happened, I researched it to see, you know, if the procedure was proper or not. Because I always wanted, if I got it wrong, I wanted to get it right next time. So, what I found out is that Robert's Rules of Order provides that the the most common form of voting is the voice vote. On a voice vote, it's the chairman's obligation to to count the votes. Certainly, it's reasonable for a, a chairman hearing all ayes and no nays to assume everybody voted aye. However, that may not be the case. If you have eight people there, you may not have had six people vote aye. She just couldn't hear it, or a chairman might not hear it. There is the right of any member of the body, after a voice vote, to say, Mr. Chairman, we, I would ask for a, a different vote. At that point, you could have a, a rising vote where a member stands to signify aye and remain standing until they're counted or rise, raises their hands. Any member can ask that. The chairman can ask that if the chairman's not sure of how the vote went. Um, but that's in the chairman's discretion. And that'll be in your memo as well? well it will. Great. Thank you. Okay. Just one quick observation. I, you sent out a, a little email yesterday relative to Wayne's meeting, uh, potential planning. Where, where, you, where Wayne was looking for an executive session, uh, and, and and I think uh, you know just a couple of you, I think you basically are saying, you know, executive sessions ought to be kept for a minimum if possible. Okay, uh, but but you know in in the course of the uh, you know I, I was interested in your second comment as it related to 
you know, what Wayne was saying, we ought to have an executive session because we're going to be tied into a communications network. And we m may discuss in the course of that maybe some HIPAA type situation, medical emergencies. And y you said, uh, well, what about us in executive session? We're going to hear, we're going to hear those ourselves. So, which doesn't uh, appear to be fair. So, it, so it just try to try to somehow figure it out where, where we don't get involved in that issue. Okay. All right. Thank you. The last item, I guess we're just going to postpone to October where somebody from Warren County Soil and Water District will speak to and inform us about what agricultural districts are about. Okay. <coughs> One other thing in our October meeting that Supervisor Simpson had asked me to share with you and we can conclude unless there's other matters, I will share this with you in brief. It is just saying that um, we would support access for like handicapped people and so forth in parts of the Adirondacks. All right, but I'll hand it out. I just gave it to you in brief and that may not do justice to it. And uh, I'll put this to consider on the next month's agenda as well. Okay, Amanda. Anything else for the good of the order? I'm going to allow this. All right. Seeing none, motion to adjourn. <laughs> no, he is veteran. Motion to adjourn by and Councilman Bramer, seconded by uh, Councilman or Supervisor <laughs> Gerard. I'm so used to the town board. <laughs> Committee adjourned. Thank you. Thank you for all for.